Over the last 20 years, I have been a television and radio reporter in the Pacific Northwest. And during that period of time, I have passed along to the public hundreds of news stories from all portions of the world about the UFOs, the unidentified flying objects, the flying saucers. I have seen UFOs. But in all of those news stories, I've detected one missing fact one incredible, glaring omission. Not one world public agency or scientific group has even offered a partial solution to this most amazing mystery of all time. No public authority has told us who are the overlords of the UFO and why are they here right now at this time. There is no Air Force defending any portion of this planet that can truthfully deny that the following documented incidents did take place and that similar incidents are taking place almost every day somewhere in the world. In the southeastern United States, military aircraft have disappeared. And UFOs have been connected with those disappearances. Near Pascagoula, Mississippi, two shipyard workers were taken aboard a UFO and given physical examination. In 1976, in Kentucky, three women were taken aboard a UFO and terrorized while the humanoid crewman of the UFO gave them physical examination. In Wyoming, in 1975, an oil exploration foreman while elk hunting was picked up by a UFO along with the elk and was medically examined and returned to the elk hunting area by the UFO crewman. In Arizona in 1975, while working in open country, Travis Walton was zapped away for five days and kept aboard a UFO. A few weeks previously, near Alamogordo, New Mexico, a member of the U.S. military was examined by the humanoid crewman of a UFO. Rather than reveal that fact, the U.S. military found duty for Staff Sergeant Charles L. Moody in Western Europe. Before the kidnappers of the UFO, humans seem helpless. The largest circulation newspaper in the United States offers a million dollar reward for decisive UFO information. According to UFO contactees, this is what a UFO humanoid crewman looks like. This is the best UFO photograph in the world. The military took it years ago 
and kept it secret. NASA reveals its UFO policy. NASA astronauts have seen UFOs. You learn for the first time what the Air Force Academy teaches its cadet officers about the reality of the UFO. You learn UFO fact, not science fiction. In a surprise ending, you'll see the answers to this incredible worldwide UFO mystery. The origin of the alien intelligences who are the overlords of the UFO. You know, Captain, I keep thinking about a real problem, and it's bugging me. What's that? Well, remember the uh, TWA case when uh, Captain Schemmel dived under a UFO and about a dozen passengers got hurt? Boy, I sure do, yeah. Ever think of what that would be like on a 747? Well, I've, I've thought about it, but I don't talk about it too much. Well, we got three or four hundred passengers and 20 stews moved around the cabin. Most of the passengers don't keep their seat belts fastened. Now, if a big UFO came on a collision course, and with a 747 cruising at over 600 miles an hour, we'd have just a couple of seconds to take an evasive action of some sort, a, a dive or a zoom. 300 people would be smashed around and a lot of them hurt. Some could be even killed. You couldn't tell what would happen in that cabin. Probably panic. Well, panic at the least, but... You know, even if you got control and got down okay, the airlines couldn't hide a thing like that. But the FAA doesn't want to hear about UFOs. And they don't tell us, that's for sure. Now, if we talk about UFOs to the news media, we somehow get blacklisted and our jobs are in jeopardy. As an airlines pilot, no matter how many UFOs I see in the air, I'm not telling anybody about it. In the last half of this century, there has been one mind-boggling giant of a mystery, which has overridden the knowledge gathered by mankind through the ages. There seems to be no answer to the reason for the appearances of the unidentified flying objects, the UFOs. Public opinion pollster George Gallup reports that perhaps 15 million U.S. citizens, scientists, and other responsible observers have seen the so-called flying saucers, the UFOs. Who are the overlords of the UFO? What is their origin and their mission? On July 31st, 1952, in the Italian Alps, north of Milan, Engineer Gian Pietro Mongusi took these pictures of the landing of a UFO on the rough ice of the Churchin Glacier. The UFO landing was only three minutes in duration. A humanoid in some kind of space suit with equipment on his back emerged from the UFO, walked part way around it, and then re-entered and Mongoosey had the pictures to prove it. Verification of the origin of these photographs was made for the producers of this motion picture by a Swiss researcher and niece of psychiatrist Dr. Carl Gustav Jung Miss Lou Zinstag. Since that time, world newspapers have made note of UFO stories in all degrees, from casual mention to news of an all-out UFO invasion. The mental health of UFO observers was questioned. From 1951, another photograph of a UFO from Riverside, California, showing the very significant bell-shaped configuration with three spheres projecting from its underside. This is the most familiar type of UFO and has been seen and photographed worldwide by UFO researchers. Who are the alien intelligences behind this type of space travel device? Are the UFOs friend or foe? 
1973, another significant UFO picture shows not only the anti-gravity device operational, but also with it is a smaller degravitated sphere under the control of the alien intelligences of the UFO. Who are the overlords of the UFO? In the Mediterranean, on a Sicilian beach, two small UFOs in the act of materialization from another dimension are observed by excited local citizens. Materialization, a concept far beyond the understanding of modern science, but used by the alien intelligences of the UFO. A PhD in biochemistry on the faculty of the University of Oregon in Eugene took this picture of a UFO in the act of materialization from another dimension. Three times during the shutter snap interval, the UFO appeared and disappeared, and here is the evidence. The scientist, fearful of the scorn of his fellows, kept his name secret. He had no desire to investigate one of the most incredible events of the science of the coming 21st century to which he had been witness and to which he had photographic evidence. Kidnappings have occurred of military jets, people, and automobiles full of people. The military is helpless, and so are the police departments of the world. Where is the origin of the UFOs? UFO Quebec. Carried this sketch of a UFO humanoid crewman with a map of the star system in the vicinity of Zeta Reticuli, many light years away. This was indicated to UFO contactees Betty and Barney Hill. Is it truth or is it a cover-up story? Two UFOs over San Francisco, similar to UFO surveillance stories and photographs to come from every major city in the world. Iron Curtain scientists have stated publicly their feeling not only that UFOs are real, but that they have the same type of experiences which match those published in the Western world. We now reveal the facts of the UFO which couldn't be kept secret. The planet's most incredible unsolved mystery. Despite the cover-up efforts of world governments, a world silence, silenced by fear, and a helpless world military, private scientific investigators all over the planet have contributed the UFO evidence which we now reveal. The UFO, the secret that couldn't be kept, that can no longer be covered up. Mount Rainier in the state of Washington was the area where private pilot businessman Ken Arnold, flying back to his Idaho home, first saw nine disc-like flying objects on the sunny afternoon of 24 June 1947. They were moving at 1,500 miles an hour, a speed far exceeding anything we could put into the air at the time. When he landed his airplane at Pendleton, Oregon, he reported the sighting of inverted saucers moving at incredible speed. The next day on the radio news broadcasts and in the newspapers, the story sensationalized the term flying saucers. The previous summer of 1946, a member of the U.S. military encountered a giant UFO in a near-miss aerial situation, and the Air Force kept the threat to air safety secret. This event happened on the first day of August 1946 to the man second in charge of flight safety for the U.S. Tactical Air Command, Captain Jack E. Puckett. Captain Puckett's UFO encounter occurred about 30 miles from McDill Air Force Base near Tampa, Florida, where his twin-engine C-47 airplane nearly collided with an airborne object about twice the size of a B-29 bomber, or about 300 feet long. His report further described the UFO as being cigar-shaped or cylindrical, and with what appeared to be glowing portholes. 
governmental agencies have not responded to anxious questions from UFO observers. The Federal Aviation Administration has no UFO policy or opinion. The U.S. Air Force says it has aborted its UFO study program. No answer has been publicly given. UFOs still continue to be sighted worldwide. At the U.S. Air Force Academy in Colorado Springs, the cadets in training will become the officers who will police our airspace for the next crucial decade. While in the air, in the most complex airborne machines that our engineering science can design, they will encounter the far more sophisticated UFO, which worldwide research has now shown can disable the most reliable electrical and electronic systems of an airplane. The course of instruction at the U.S. Air Force Academy must contain some reliable information concerning the reality of the UFO. Of all government agencies' questions, the most responsive answer to that question has come from the Department of Physics at the Air Force Academy in a letter from its former director, Colonel Anthony J. Mione, who says in part, In this text, an expanded section on UFOs and extraterrestrial life is included. The section attempts to provide a hopefully unbiased summary of UFO information and concludes the best thing to do is to keep an open and skeptical mind and not take an extreme position on any side of the question. To further expand on the background we hope our graduates will have, we invited and had Dr. Stanton Friedman visit with us last April. During his visit, he presented two large audience lectures and two seminars essentially in support of his subject, Flying Saucers Are Real. I hope you gather that we do make a continuing and real effort to provide our students with all views of current topics. They are expected to come to their own mature conclusions based upon the broadest foundation of knowledge and information that we can provide. Yours truly, Anthony J. Mione, Colonel, United States Air Force, Professor and Head of the Department of Physics. He tells of the text, Introductory Space Science, and reveals exactly what the cadets at the Academy are being taught about UFOs today. These are the men who will have to make crucial decisions while in the air when they encounter the incredible UFO. In the past, officers of the Air Forces of the world were given no instructions or any preparation whatsoever for this mind-chilling experience when they meet the spacecraft of the overlords of the UFO face to face. Nor have our astronauts been given proper instruction. From Introductory Space Science, Volume 2, page 466. We should not deny the possibility of alien control of UFOs on the basis of preconceived notions not established as related to the UFO. Our physics may not apply. From available information, the UFO phenomenon appears to have been global in nature for almost 50,000 years. Known witnesses have been reliable people. This leaves us with the possibility of alien-controlled UFOs by visitors to this planet from this solar system or other solar systems. The existence of at least three or possibly four different groups of aliens, possibly at different stages of development, which implies the existence of intelligent life on the planets in our solar system or a surprisingly strong interest in Earth by members of other solar systems the Air Force Academy text admonishes its officers in training to keep an open mind on the baffling subject of unidentified flying objects. Maybe it's the honeymoon capital, this corner of the galaxy. Maybe the, the lecturer selected by the U.S. Air Force Academy to establish for their officers in training that flying saucers are real was Stanton Friedman. 
He had been appearing on the lecture circuit in various U.S. colleges as a UFO analyst with a high level of scientific training. Friedman's academic background includes a bachelor's and master's degree in nuclear physics from the University of Chicago. His employment background included much high-level work in space science in the area of fusion rocket research and nuclear-powered aircraft. He was 14 years with such aerospace contractors as TRW Systems, Westinghouse, and General Electric. He says UFOs are the most challenging scientific problem of this or any other age. He made the following statements in public in Seattle, Washington, the home of one of the world's largest aerospace manufacturers, Boeing. And the government has never really said what it's been credited as saying, that there are no flying signs. They really word their press releases very carefully. The press takes it that last step. Uh, I think every government in the world has three major problems along these lines with regard to UFOs. One, they'd like themselves to figure out how it works, because it makes a great weapons delivery system. It makes anything worth flying look pretty naive by comparison. Two, you'd want to make sure that the other guy doesn't figure out how to duplicate their behavior, because then you have a defense problem. If he's got something that flies like these things, we got a problem, because we can't handle it. And three, perhaps most important, a kind of philosophical, political problem, as soon as it becomes obvious to the people on the planet, and widely accepted that flying saucers are real and from off the Earth, there's going to be a push for a view of man as earthlings, the people on this planet. Instead of, I'm an American or Russian or Chinese, I'm an earthling. There is no government that wants its citizens to owe their primary allegiance to the planet as opposed to the country. Nobody wants to give up their power. And you know, all these jokes about take me to your leader, that's wishful thinking. What's funny about those is that there is no leader to be taken to. There's nobody who speaks for planet Earth. So there are enormous political problems with anybody saying, yes, there's somebody out there and he's coming here and he doesn't want to talk to me as a representative of the planet. Who do we, how do we choose who speaks for the planet? I don't know. Since the 1950s, it has been easy to point to the millions of suns in space and speculate that somewhere out there is the home of the UFO. That UFOs are spacecraft from some other Earth, orbiting some other sun, just like ours from a visible sun in the visible universe. Perhaps so, perhaps not. But the UFOs could also be from an invisible dimension in the invisible portion of the universe, which our science cannot easily detect. Perhaps one or possibly both of these concepts will one day be the explanation of the origin of the UFO. The Air Force Academy text on space science concedes that two, three, or even four levels of alien intelligences might be involved. NASA at the Johnson Space Flight Center near Houston, Texas, only concerns itself with the visible universe with aerospace contracts administering the manufacturing of visible metal vehicles, making visibly televised trips in the Earth-Moon area, and with probes within the solar system by unmanned devices. NASA astronauts in their Skylab make a track across the nighttime sky, lit by millions of suns. The activities of the astronauts are minutely planned and carried out, but the framework is that of Earth science as we understand and engineer its applications. There seems little room for productive scientific speculation, perhaps because of the $38 billion NASA space budget, which is highly criticized in many quarters. It is difficult to explain why the planners of NASA's space program would refuse to admit the spacecraft capabilities of the alien intelligences who built this device, first seen over the Korean battle area in 1952 and photographed by the U.S. military. This picture was available to NASA. 
Obviously, it is not a picture of anything manufactured by humans on this earth. It was classified then and now as an unidentified flying object, a UFO. Can we now identify it? Is this actual photographic evidence that proves that alien intelligences use a spacecraft like this to travel from their dimension to our reality? Is a Watergate-type scientific cover-up involved? Let's now examine that possibility. NASA first had warnings of UFOs from the pilots of its own X-15 project. The X-15 is a rocket-powered airplane which is launched high over the desert test area in California. The B-29 bomber is the launch vehicle which takes off, flies to its highest possible altitude, and then launches the little rocket-powered airplane. The test pilot gives it power and the airplane goes through its maneuver. Various complex engineering problems are worked out by such testing. And the engineering flight test pilot is one busy man. But on May 30th, 1962, Test pilot Joe Walton photographed five disc-like objects from the X-15 rocket test airplane. The UFOs were very similar to the disc-like objects seen over Mount Rainier 15 years earlier by Ken Arnold. NASA made no public mention of what the discs were, their origin, or any scientific speculation whatsoever about this observance of their X-15 project by intelligences of the UFO. On July 17th of that same year, this time at an altitude of about 58 miles, test pilot Bob White noted that he had UFO company and photographed unexplained objects even closer to his X-15. Across the nation, news headlines state that 26 astronauts have seen and photographed UFOs. The public is puzzled by NASA's silence on the subject. The producers of this motion picture were answered on two occasions by high public affairs administrators of NASA, who stated, It's not in our charter to investigate the UFO. Inside the Skylab in zero gravity, the astronauts go through the day and night with their every minute carefully scheduled. The scientific experiments are in almost every instance planned, not to open new areas of the unknown in cosmic science, but to reinforce the ideas we already hold regarding the reality of the universe. Planners have left no time or leeway in which the UFO can be postulated, thought about, or examined. Certainly few startling public announcements have been made of any new discoveries during space missions. No new theories have been advanced. Astronaut Jack Lausma in Skylab 3 saw a glowing red object making its way across the field of his vision. He photographed it from his little planetoid in space, the NASA Skylab. It could have been explained as a meteor glowing red in space, except that there is no atmosphere in space whose friction could heat a meteor to a red glow. Was it a UFO observing Skylab? NASA remains silent. Complex instrument packages such as Explorer 10 vanish in space. Launched on the 25th of March, 1961, it disappeared, although its life expectancy was over 100 years. Perhaps some alien intelligence is examining this complex NASA space device. NORAD cannot find it, and it is not transmitting. It just disappeared. What is the photographic evidence that UFOs are watching our every space move? Why is it so hard for the project managers of NASA 
to accept the reality of the UFO. Is there a high-level scientific cover-up? And if so, why? Governments are charged with upholding the law, and no law on Earth is more basic than the law of gravity. No wonder the obvious anti-gravity capability of the UFO makes governments uncomfortable. Bravely, some astronauts have stated that they believe in the reality of the UFO and the capability of the UFO to defy gravity while our giant rockets consume enormous amounts of fuel, putting a simple space capsule or Skylab in orbit. In the dark blue of space, in silence orbiting the Earth, the Skylab is the planetoid home of its crew. The crew is like the NASA test pilots in the X-15, busily occupied and concerned with the scientific work outlined for them by their NASA masters. Life support in Earth orbit is a scientific victory in itself and a major achievement for Earthlings. But outside alien intelligences are again observing the progress of man from Earth. Two UFOs are photographed by an astronaut during a spacewalk. The hatch is open. The astronaut is working his problem. Again, two UFOs split by. Just moving lights, something that could be easily ignored unless we obtained other pictures and other explanations. Actual pictures which could identify the UFO as a solid object with a mission and under intelligent control. One of the most remarkable instances of UFO photography took place in 1968, here above the Boeing Space Laboratory, south of Renton, Washington. Several photographs were taken of a UFO by then 14-year-old Scott Silty. It showed its anti-gravity capabilities as it hovered over the center in two locations. His efforts produced probably the only detailed shots of a UFO materializing to show configuration and portholes. His junior high school instructor, Jim Holm, was given the negatives to develop. Holmes, he didn't know what to expect, but became a believer when he saw what the young Silty had apparently captured on film. When they came in that morning and they said, uh, hey, we got the pictures we were talking about, uh, naturally, you know, junior high students, you're a little bit reluctant to believe everything they say. But then, uh, you know, as things proceeded, uh, what happened was I developed the pictures and uh, we know the results now. Uh, what is your impression of what that object is? Uh, I'm always hesitant, but... Uh, uh, I would have to say that believing the students and the type of students they were, uh, it almost definitely had to be some type of a flying object. Right out there. Right. And uh, it's a little eerie. The, the thing that shook me up at first is I was reluctant to believe them. And uh, when I printed the or developed the film, I really couldn't see that much. But I was shocked, I have to admit, I was shocked when I put it in the enlarger. And through the enlarger, I could see a great deal more of what the object looked like. Like and, the portholes. Right. That was, I would say, the portholes was the most shocking part because then it really, it looked different than just a glow in the sky in a certain form. Like you always hear the thing, you know, swamp gas and that sort of thing but no swamp gas is going to have portholes or a configuration a geometric the way that was. One man who has spent the last 25 years researching and keeping track of UFO sightings in the United States is Seattle fireman Robert Gribble. He has spent his spare time gathering all data possible that will help him keep track of when and where they take place. The pins on this map indicate sightings in the U.S. for just one year. Over the past quarter century, he has come to some conclusions based on the number of sightings he has recorded. We have received and recorded some 30,000 sightings since 1955. Have you noticed any particular patterns that develop in uh, pinpointing the UFO sightings on these maps? No, we have found no marked pattern, although we do believe that they are following 
two procedures, one a surveillance of the land area, the very close surveillance, and a close surveillance of the people, and it seems to fluctuate from one to the other. Now, through all these years of research, you must have drawn some conclusions about what they are, what the UFOs are. Well, we firmly believe that uh, what the people are seeing in those objects which we have classified as unknown are actually vehicles uh, not manufactured on this planet. How can you draw that conclusion? How do you know? Well, the vehicles that have been seen in the United States, and there are good records of this uh, for the last 200 years, and actually the records go back into history for some 3,000 years. The same thing that we're seeing then are being seen today. We understand that there are several hot spots in the United States, the UFO sighting areas, and one of them happens to be in the southwestern United States in Utah. There have been uh, a tremendous amount of uh, sightings in the uh, southwest over the years with a uh, very large concentration in the uh, Utah area. The Canadian UFO Report was one of the initial UFO publications to headline the story of the possibility that much of the early Mormon history tells of a contact with an alien intelligence, the angel Maroni. It opens the possibility that the founder of Mormonism, their prophet Joseph Smith, may have been one of the greatest of UFO contactees. Dr. Frank B. Salisbury, on the faculty of the State University of Utah in Logan, and himself a Mormon, does not doubt that possibility. He has stated publicly that he believes that his UFO study has established the probability that the Earth is being visited by UFOs that seem to be using the isolated area of eastern Utah as an Earth base. In March of 1975, a national tabloid newspaper circulated the following story of a UFO kidnapping. The producers of this motion picture interviewed Carl Higdon, who furnished the artist's conception of the android crewman from the UFO who kidnapped him and took him aboard the UFO to elsewhere. Hagen was given a physical examination in a tower by a huge TV-like eye, rejected, and was returned to the elk hunting area in Wyoming where he was picked up. While on his eight-hour UFO trip, he encountered a teenage boy, two young girls, and a man in his 60s, also guests of the UFO intelligences. Upon his return, he suffered radiation symptoms with itching skin and burning eyes. Area Sheriff Ogburn and his deputy Ed Tierney investigated the incident. So did Dr. Leo Sprinkle of the University of Wyoming, who gives us this professional opinion as to the truth of this verified UFO kidnapping. To whom it may concern, my impression of Carl Higdon is that he's a man of integrity with average education, but a keen sense of curiosity about the world around him. He's an outdoors man and seems to have developed good skills of estimating size and distance. Although the sighting of a single UFO witness often is difficult to evaluate, the indirect evidence supports the tentative conclusion that Carl Higdon is reporting sincerely the events that he experienced. Hopefully, further statements from other persons can be obtained to support the basic statement. Respectfully submitted by R. Leo Sprinkle, Ph.D., the University of Wyoming in Laramie. UFO traffic in the Rocky Mountain area of Utah, Arizona, and New Mexico reached a high level in the November, December, and January period of 1975 and 76, with police departments reporting large cigar-shaped UFOs and other UFO types of spacecraft hovering for days at a time over cities in this area. Five witnesses working in the open country around Snowflake and Holbrook in northeast Arizona had the most incredible personal UFO experience story to tell and passed lie detector tests in their telling of it before police and psychiatrist witnesses. 22-year-old Travis Walton suddenly disappeared one morning as the group was working in the open country. Dwayne Smith, Kenneth Peterson, Alan Dallas, Mike Rogers, and John Golette were involved in the significant UFO kidnapping incident in which a greenish-blue light originating from a UFO overhead 
zapped Travis Walton into an invisible dimension from which he returned five days later. His brother tells of the incident. He spent five days on a UFO, uh, he thinks. Now, there is some small time loss in there. But uh, for all intent and purposes, he spent five days on there. He did come in contact with some beings that are human-like, but they weren't human. And uh, he had quite an experience. He said he doesn't remember anything about a blue light in the first encounter last Wednesday. The blue light that they saw, he said... Uh, at that instant, he got felt like he got hit in the forehead with a baseball bat, and it knocked him out. And he woke up. He was aboard one of the craft. And uh, they never spoke to him. They led him around by the hand. They wouldn't, they wouldn't talk to him. They showed him this and that. And uh, when they let him off, he woke up. Did he say they were friendly creatures? Smiled all the time, friendly. Never harmed him. They, don't, he, they were just as nice as they could be. But there was a total lack of communication, either verbal or mental. And he said that's what made him so upset that he couldn't uh, speak with them. That's what he was very, very disgusted about that, nervous and uh, just plain disgust, the chance of a lifetime, and they wouldn't cooperate. Obviously, Duane, you know your own brother probably better than anybody else. Uh, do you believe the story? I've never seen him play a practical joke in his adult life. A psychiatrist tells of his examination of Travis. Our conclusion, which is absolute, uh, is that uh, this young man is not lying. Uh, there's no collusion involved, no, no attempt at hoax or collusion with the family or anyone else. Uh, there's a rumor around that there's contracts, there are no such contracts, uh, no motivation for a lie. Any possibility of lying or hoax as you see it? None whatsoever. As we have indicated, UFOs can create a tremendous spatial energy flow. One of the most startling examples of that occurred several years ago on Vashon Island, which is located in the Pacific Northwest in Puget Sound, not far from Seattle, Washington. It was near the tiny town of Vashon that several UFO sightings had taken place in the late 1960s. So the fact that local residents had seen such phenomena was not startling. But the fact surrounding one of the incidents was unusual, to say the least. So it was out, out in that area? Yeah. On the night of the 19th of February, 1968, Detective Lieutenant Terry Allman was dispatched to an old gravel pit area west of town. Some young people had seen a UFO, and the King County Sheriff's Office was sent to investigate. The temperature was 50 degrees. Allman tells of what he saw. Well, there was a lot of ice that really had no reason to actually be there. It wasn't that cold. Out. And uh, did it have a certain consistency or something unusual about it? Well, it was an inch and a half thick and it was rather milky and bubble. Mm -hmm. And what, what was the impression that uh, you had, or why did you have the impression that it was some strange phenomenon that created this? Well, I can't be sure about that, except it was entirely too warm out to, to have ice like that. Uh, one of the other officers had responded to a UFO call at that same location the night before. The UFO energy flow had apparently left a solid sheet of ice as it supercooled the area below the UFO as it took off. At the freezing temperature of 32 degrees, it would take some 113 hours to freeze the pond 50 feet in diameter with a sheet of ice 2 inches thick, and the weather had not been that cold. The UFO did it. Because of official concealment, Niles, and just plain ordinary bureaucratic cover-up during the 1950s and 60s, many cases of UFOs establishing themselves as a menace to commercial airlines' safety of flight had been concealed. One night, 10 of 85 passengers aboard an American Airlines commercial flight were injured when their pilot, Captain Ed Bachner, took evasive action to avoid a UFO encounter. It happened to flight number 966 on the night of 17 July 1957 on a flight from El Paso to Dallas, just 50 miles east of El Paso over Salt Flats, Texas. The UFO continued along the Gulf Coast to Gulfport, Mississippi, where it turned north. Traffic control radar tracked the UFO and the military was alerted. In the vicinity of Meridian, Mississippi, the Wing Intelligence RB-47 electronic surveillance airplane 
tuned in the UFO's emission on its ALA-5 pulse analyzer. As it moved west toward Dallas, Texas, the pulse train of the UFO was analyzed as having a 3,000 megacycle envelope, a duration of two millionths of a second, and a repetition rate of 600 times a second. This was identifiable electromagnetic emission from a UFO, which was also being tracked by military and federal aviation agency radar. The UFO circled Dallas and Fort Worth, Texas, and headed north to Oklahoma City, and continued its track north, followed by the Wing Intelligence electronic surveillance aircraft. This was continued until the U.S. Air Force plane was to run low on fuel near Forbes Air Force Base. At 1.45 on the morning of April 3, 1975, some 20 or more law enforcement officers in five North Carolina counties pursued a bright, glowing, unidentified alien spacecraft. Newspaper headlines told of a major incident which was, in effect, kept secret from the rest of the nation. Newspapers, radio, and television all over the world remained silent on the stories because wire service editors did nothing to emphasize their significance. From police descriptions, the artist has been able to draw the lighted V-shaped UFO which appeared. No responsible agency gave to the public any scientifically supported explanation of the origin or mission of the alien space travel device. The story was much the same two and a half years earlier in Pascagoula, Mississippi. The Pascagoula Press first headlined the story October 12, 1973, and told the nation about two shipyard workers, Calvin Parker and Charles Hickson, who had their fishing trip interrupted by a glowing, blue-lighted UFO which landed near them. Two humanoids took them aboard for a physical examination, placing them under a large TV-like eye. Scientists were quoted as saying that the UFO report was true. NASA was supposed to probe, but didn't. Federal agencies were asked to investigate, but didn't. Hickson said the creatures from the UFO seemed friendly, but that they acted controlled, as if they had a specific thing to do, and did it. They were about five feet high, pale and ghost-like, with crab-like hands and rounded feet. As Hickson and Parker were taken aboard, they suddenly began to float on air, became weightless, and totally helpless. In the Gulf South, from Louisiana to Florida, hundreds of reports to police and sightings by police officers told of UFO activity that same night. No government agency concerned itself with this UFO kidnapping publicly. Luckily, Hickson and Parker were returned. But what of the kidnapped victims of the UFO intelligence's who are not returned. Are the UFOs friend or foe? Or are they conducting a project in which humans become nothing more than guinea pigs? This is serious speculation. 
kidnap victims seem to end up on a missing persons list, and no agency on earth can locate them. The alien intelligences of the UFO are from somewhere, either in our dimension or from another dimension, which is difficult for anyone to detect. Misunderstanding the complete dominance of man by the UFO intelligences led the city fathers of Ocean Springs on the Gulf Coast to seriously decide to solve the problem by passing a law prohibiting the landing of UFOs in that area. Alderman William F. Dale, Jr. thought the local police should be able to handle it. It almost became a law. But the mayor of Ocean Springs, Tom Stennis, broke the tie vote. He said... Let's make them welcome. As yet, no world governmental agency has demonstrated the power either to make UFOs welcome or to combat their landings and possible kidnapping. It's obvious that humans are helpless. Since 1966, the very competent scientific analysts of the British publication The Flying Saucer Review have been assembling all available information about alien intelligences who have made repeated UFO landings in the high Pyrenees mountains between France and Spain. So have the defense authorities of both nations. The UMO intelligences claim they come from what we know as Star System Wolf 424 some 14.6 light years from Earth, 90 trillion miles. Near their home planet, their UFO space travel device enters a black hole in space. A giant energy whirlpool vortex which hurls their spacecraft into another dimension in which time hardly exists. From this, they emerge into our dimension, into our solar system, and proceed to their expeditionary target, Earth. Later, the UMOs were to tell the European investigators that the universe was at least a ten-dimension unity. Perhaps even more, they were not certain. But they knew of and used at least ten dimensions of reality. Each reality was separate from each of the others. Each of the ten realities had its own rules of energy manipulation. Even though there were ten dimensions which were open to space travel, reckless energy misuse in one dimension can disturb the cosmic unity of another dimension and its inhabitants. Telepathy is used to receive knowledge during space travel. The mind, said the UMOs in the quiet areas of space, is especially open to pure cosmic knowledge received by telepathy. Any mentality can receive and benefit from knowledge received by telepathy. The more telepathic ability is exercised, the more valuable it becomes, the UMOs learned, as they learned many of the high scientific secrets of the solar systems they traveled through in their space exploration projects. Target Earth was to be another of their cosmic projects. The UMOs first learned of the planet Earth with inhabitants of some intelligence in the Earth year 1950. They landed and left eight of their males and females in the area which had high mountains between France and Spain. Since that time, they have studied the new planet and the method of mental understanding used by its inhabitants. They found Earth science could not account for cosmic beings like themselves. They have carefully made themselves known to certain people of France and Spain, about 30 in all. They have tried to understand the limitations which exist in the mind of man. They find human knowledge inadequate and much inferior to the cosmic understanding. 
which permit space voyages between the Yumo position in the universe and the Earth. At 800,000 miles, Jupiter looks to the Earth-developed eye like this, to the Yumo, perhaps different. Jupiter's moon, Ganymede, is some 8,000 miles away and moves in its orbit. Its diameter, 3,000 miles. The UMO intelligences took a heat measurement of the Jupiter hotspot. They compared the measurements to that of the surface of their sun and found it about the same. The other Jupiter moons were identified. Europa, Amalthea, Callisto, as they were named by Earth astronomers. The spacecraft continued to the next solar system checkpoint, also at the same time slowing its rate of travel. Saturn was identified with its strange moon, Titan. Titan rolled along the equatorial plane of Saturn like a wheel on a road. The Yumos identified its atmosphere, methane. In the vicinity of Saturn, they tuned to the history and the totality of knowledge of the solar system accumulated since the time the sun was born. Knowledge lost and knowledge still used and knowledge to be rediscovered. It was from this Saturn knowledge store that the UMO intelligences learned of humankind's achievements and failures. They learned, too, of the state of development of the plant and animal life and all details of Earth and the other planets. They continued their journey past Saturn, its bright rings shining a dark space blue in the Titan sky. The cosmic voyage continued to Mars. A close look at Mars revealed snow at the base of its mountains of Mitchell. On Mars, with its thin atmosphere and low water vapor content, the snow behaves differently than on mountain peaks on Earth. Mars, they passed scarcely a hundred miles from Phobos, one of its two moons. Four thousand miles above the red storm-swept planet, Phobos is a dark clump, only 16 miles in length. The final checkpoint of the cosmic voyage brought a strange and beautiful sight. Their project destination, Earth, was eclipsing its own sun and they passed over the Earth's moon just beneath. They had come nearly 90 trillion miles, 14.6 light years, elapsed Earth time just about seven months. came now the moment to synchronize the UMO UFO space travel time with the time of the expedition's target, Earth. By telepathic means, the UMO alien intelligences claim to have notified some 20 selected Earth people of various responsible backgrounds to expect the UMO UFO. These people lived in Spain. The British Flying Saucer Review headlined an attempt by the Spanish Air Force to intercept the UMO UFO.
Japan Andorra radio station employee also noticed the UFO as it neared its destination in the Pyrenees Mountains between France and Spain. The UMO spacecraft, after its cosmic voyage, became visible over the Pyrenees Mountains, and the IH superimposed marking, unlike any alphabetical symbol on Earth, was photographed. The first pictures taken were from the ground near the outskirts of Madrid on February 6, 1966, and again on the 10th of June, 1967. They are known as the San Jose de Valderas photographs, which were published nationally in Spain after thorough investigation by the national magazine Horizonte. During the years since 1966, much of the UMO information has been investigated by competent people of England, France, and Spain. And to this date, such evidence as these UFO photographs appears to be factual. Dr. Claude Poer, director of scientific programs in the French Center for Spatial Studies, stated publicly that a two-year investigation resulted in staggering confirmation of statements made by the non-earthly intelligences. The French Minister of Defense, Jean-Claude Bauré, in a nationwide radio broadcast, confirmed that the National Police in France had a great number of statements on file from reliable witnesses who had reported over the last few years UFO appearances. He said he believed the reports tell of scientifically interesting events and that the top scientists of France were making a continuing study of reported UFO sightings. From those files comes this photograph of a UFO taken at night as it was tracked across France. This is known as the Valençol UFO. The device is emitting brilliantly colored radiation and seems solid. If so, it is obviously capable of defying gravity. The French defense minister says that this type of appearance is being studied seriously by French science. Not so in the United States, where even the anti-gravity capability of the UFO is being ignored by official science. As they said in Spain, the alien intelligences of the UFO may originate from a planet called UMO, 16 light years from Earth, and they may not have. If we are to understand the origin of the UFO, we must be ready to vision another dimension which penetrates our earthly reality. It is a higher energy dimension from which the UFO can materialize to our vision, our cameras, and our scientific instrumentation. It is back into this higher energy dimension that the UFO returns to report to those who sent it out. The crew of the UFO is an especially designed robot humanoid which was produced to do its job in both dimensions. Target Earth is a long time intelligence and sample gathering project of the aliens of the UFO. The incredible energy manipulation which enables UFOs to move between dimensions seems to occur under water. The Puerto Rican deep, which extends 30,000 feet under the sea, is one such area. Seawater covers two-thirds of the surface of the Earth, and in that water, lives one of the Earth's most intelligent and environmentally adjusted creatures, the dolphin. The dolphin's brain is substantially more complex and in some ways superior to the brain of man. The dolphin's telepathic ability is highly developed and with it he excels at communication with other dolphins. Today, the Canadian-edited UFO report and other such publications 
are the only other mediums which have carried stories which have filled the Venezuela newspapers and tell of UFOs which emerge from under the sea off Puerto Rico and continue to the U.S., South America, and Europe. Undersea disturbances of a major nature have occurred in this area for many years. The National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration's NOAA satellite had communications blacked out many times as it passed over the area some 800 miles up in its orbit, reported Dr. Wayne Mesigian of Longwood College in Farmville, Virginia. In 1945, the U.S. Navy lost five torpedo bombers and a large four-motored flying boat searching for the lost Navy pilots. Commercial and private airplane pilots have seen their aircraft under this strange influence lose instrumentation and electrical control. Airlines issue denials and pilots are afraid to talk in public because of fear for their jobs. In March of 1973, a series of events near Caracas, Venezuela, a few hundred miles to the south, established what may be a link between the very deep ocean areas of the Caribbean and the UFO. On March 22nd, hundreds of people witnessed a pair of flying objects trailing blue smoke as they approached from out of the sea and then hung motionless near the Caracas airport. Then with a shrieking sound and a burst of orange flame, separated and vanished one to the east and one to the west. For the next nine days, UFOs rose out of the sea, hung in the air, remained motionless, and in various manners cavorted over the metropolitan city of Caracas, Venezuela. The Caracas newspaper, Ultimus Noticias, carried the UFO stories and reached the conclusion that thousands of its readers are now convinced that by evidence of their own eyes, UFOs have an undersea base in the Caribbean. UFO traffic into and out of the sea was seen by hundreds of witnesses. Other water areas have also been the site of UFO traffic. Teleportation occurs in the vicinity of a UFO. In May 1968, a well-known Buenos Aires attorney, Dr. Gerardo Vidal and his wife and children, in a Peugeot 403, were teleported 4,100 miles by a UFO and put down near Mexico City unharmed. This Ford was teleported hundreds of miles in South Africa because it was near to a UFO which degravitated it and transported it, says the Flying Saucer Review. The aliens of the UFO are energy manipulators of a very advanced nature, far beyond our science. In the search for the method of communication with alien intelligences of space, such as the overlords of the UFO, some of the most significant work in the world has been done by Dr. L.G. Lawrence, president of the Ecola Institute of San Bernardino, California, a research foundation. Dr. Lawrence is one of the world authorities on the use of biological sensors, such as that of the friendly laboratory philodendron, which senses the pain of Dr. Lawrence. As he purposely burns his thumb on his hot pipe bowl, the biological sensor, the plant, reacts with a squiggle of recognition of Dr. Lawrence's pain on the laboratory instrumentation. This is known as the Baxter effect. Dr. Lawrence developed his three-ton Stellatron for sensing biological messages which might be running free in the universe. He sets it up in remote areas and it is shielded from all electromagnetic radiation such as all radio and TV radiation for instance. It can be influenced only by the etheric or bioplasmic pulses that influence plant and animal life. On October 29, 1971, and again in April 1972, on the Mojave Desert in California, intelligent communication from the direction of Ursa Major was received. One star of that system we know is the North Star. <laughs> The intelligent character of the overall pulse train is implied by the discrete spacing patterns and the repetition of recognizable patterns. Again, for the first time in public, you now hear the modulated signals, a message as yet undeciphered, which originate in outer space. This has been brought to you by special permission of Dr. Lawrence, and it is a scientific first. <laughs> Dr. 
Dr. Lawrence reminds us that radio telescopes such as this giant multi-million dollar installation in Puerto Rico have had no results whatsoever in either sending or receiving messages in space. Radio telescopes seem useless in receiving cosmic messages probably because they are looking and listening to the wrong possible sources. He recommends biological sensors instead. His low-cost equipment has resulted in a tape recording of interstellar communication and it is on file with the Smithsonian Institution in Washington, D.C. There is perhaps no more convincing witness to the UFO than the world-famous Israeli psychic Uri Geller, whose mind-boggling extrasensory powers have baffled millions of people all over the world. Geller believes that his powers are not unique to him, but are instead proof that energies exist in many different ways than those now known to science. Later, we will see Geller demonstrate his bioenergy powers before a live audience. Geller leaves little doubt about his feelings on the subject of UFO. Let me tell you, I've never seen an extraterrestrial being in my life. I wish I will, and I know I will one day. You know, maybe they're even around us, and we don't even know. Maybe they look like people. But I have seen UFOs. But other people, I'm sure if I'll ask who saw a UFO here, some of you will raise your hands up because they exist. I, I shot pictures. As a matter of fact, I had a fight with my publisher because I wanted to publish the picture of the UFOs that I took in, in the book, and he said, no, because it's a canopy, it would be against your credibility, and I did it in the end because I'm not going to back away from the truth. I once seen... <laughs> uh, one minute. I once drove in the Sinai Desert. Do we have another minute? Yeah, go ahead. I once drove in the Sinai Desert, and believe me, with a, a high colonel and his driver, me and a doctor, and suddenly, in mid-air, in Sinai Desert, it's clear, it was 5 o'clock in the afternoon, we saw this huge object that looked like a cigar shape hanging in mid-air. And let me tell you, it was as big as three New York blocks. And it was dark. It didn't look like a flying saucer. It looked like a cigar shape. And I was shocked. And immediately, I, I get goosebumps when I talk about it. I told the driver, please, look what's going, look what, and the colonel. And you know what? They didn't see it. And they said, what are you looking at? I said, my God, can't you see that thing in the sky? They couldn't see it. So I think sometimes, what is really going on? Are they, is it really implanted in my mind? Is it really not out there and only, or is it there and only the people who believe in it can see it? I don't know. There are questions that I can't answer myself. Some call him a magician. Others call him a sorcerer. Some even call him a messiah. But whatever they call him, the world has never seen anyone quite like Uri Geller. So when Geller recently toured the United States, it was no wonder the crowds turned out to greet him, to witness his powers, and to line up for autographs on the cover of his new book. They stood in line because they had just witnessed an extraordinary sight. Hundreds brought with them broken watches and clocks, many of which hadn't run for years. Then they sat back and watched the bioenergy of Uri Geller go to work. You can see that the second hand, can the camera show the second hand? Mm, that'd be a tough shot, I think. I don't know how to show it, but it's not working, but tell me if you... It's not wild. Well, whatever, it's not, it's that, not uh, he is you working see? with, I've he's got like a whole huge handful. How many there? Maybe ten. I don't know. Let's go. This is what I want you all to do now, and I know it looks silly. I'm going to shout one, two, three, and all of us are going to shout work. I mean, we're really loud and really talk to these watches because that's the way it works. One, two, three, work! <laughs> Listen, a little louder. It's your watches, you know. We may have blown out the uh, transmitter, I think. One more time. One, two, three, work! <laughs> Hold it for me for a second. Okay. Now, what I do is I sort of finally put an energy into it. And I say work, and I just talk to these watches. And I'm sure most of them will. And just clenching his fist. Doing. He's clenching his okay, fist over and over, right. just above the I watches. Don't, no. It's working. This is working. It is. Okay, <laughs> here's, a, here's a watch that's working. Let Another one is working. Hand these, them to me, and I'll yeah, try to identify watches the watch. It's a very ornate. This is also working. Jewelry, bracelet watches. Oh, it's working. working. The second hand is sweeping along on this. Working. Uh, it's working. Here's another one. Working. This is a Timex. Here's a. Uh, Here's a Faco watch. Thank you. Goodbye. Now, wait a minute. 
Then, while hundreds watched and thousands more listened on radio station KVI, the city of Seattle witnessed the power of biological energy in an even more convincing form. This is what I want you to do. I'm holding these keys in my hand very, very gently. And what I want you to do, Ken, is put your hands on these keys, cover them, and start with cover these ones. No, not very, very gently like that, and the other one. Now, this the is what I do. It's helping Uri um, had his so hands covering the keys that I'm are in the palms now. of Uri's hands. And uh, by the way, these keys are not mine. And I'm concentrating now, and I want something to happen. Can if you feel anything in any hand, tell me. If you feel any any tingling sensation or heat or... Where do you feel this? The keys are in Uri's hands. The little boy is holding his hands over the keys, but... All right, now start concentrating, Ken. What, and what you want have to do is you have to say, Ben, I hope you have enough feeling there because I don't know how long this will take. Uri's hands are flat. His thumbs are up in the air where everybody can see them. Something is happening here. And he, say, he thinks something is happening. He has now discarded the keys in his left hand. The boy still is covering the keys in Uri's right hand. Uri, incidentally, is left-handed. Okay, put, put, um, now lift, lift your, your hand. hand. Yeah, lift your hand. Do you see any keys no. bending? I see one. Oh, yes, this is yeah. bending. One key Wait is bending. Wait a minute, I have to show this to the TV. Yeah, this key is going. Yeah, wait a minute. I... Yes, definitely. It's a big, thick, brass schlag or schlaga type of key. I don't know what this Just key like is. Just like the one he bent last night now, for you us. You see what I'm doing is I'm stroking it very, very gently. And yeah, it's curling up more. I don't know you see how that well hand? you can see it. Yeah. It's really happening, It's huh? bending even more. Yeah, this will curl up a little more here. Um, you see, I'm putting an energy into it. Can you see this from the... It's incredible. There's, no, there's absolutely no heat. Can touch the key, and you'll see the touch turn it under. Or under where it's bending. Do you feel any heat? There's absolutely no... You do feel it. <laughs> but, <there's laughs> no, but there's really no heat. It's, uh, you touch it. I mean, you, you yeah. can see yeah. there's really heat on your no, it's no, just the, the it's, body it's warmth, the body warmth, the body warmth and it's feeling. continuing to bend. I'm just going to show it to the camera. Can you see that? <laughs> oh, look! I don't know how it is. There's another one. The key, the key one. that he has bent is fastened to a key this cluster, is a, I think another and one another is key is beginning here. to bend on the cluster fastened yeah, below it. Yeah, this is going also now. But let me just talk to everybody, because the TV camera is so... To back up the biological energy demonstration, Geller called on others in the audience to check for keys which may also have responded to the presence of Geller's energy. The Seattle Post-Intelligencer told the story of hundreds of radio listeners whose keys mysteriously began bending right in their pockets. In the audience, there were others who found themselves a terminal for the newly demonstrated source of power. Keys in the audience belonging to people here who are bending. And uh, we've seen keys a couple of women have shown it, which are beginning to bend. There's uh, Here's a, a lady who is gray-haired, and she's just handed him a key. That is bent. And uh, it is beginning to bend, very slightly, but noticeably. It's unreal, because you know what's unbelievable here? That usually the kids that are coming to me, that their keys bend, and usually it happens to children. Why? Uh, because children are more open-minded to this. I mean, look, these keys, look at these keys, they're totally bent. Would you say that it's uh, necessary for a person to believe they can bend yes. before they will bend? You see, a child believes that he's, he can bend a key because he's so totally innocent to it. He totally believes that his key can bend, and it does. And it starts, and look, I mean, these keys are, I mean, you can't use these keys anymore. The scene is in the southeastern United States. And the photographer, Todd Anthony, is out to take his first trial pictures with his new 8mm motion picture camera. He goes to his local airport to photograph the action of a commercial airliner making its landing. The airplane makes its approach, and following it comes the big surprise, a UFO. The UFO, exhibiting anti-gravity capabilities, follows the airliner right down to the surface of the earth to its landing. The UFO is a bell-shaped type, which has been seen and photographed all over the world since the 1950s. From Australia to Western Europe to South Africa to Mount Palomar in California, where George Adamski made excellent still pictures, all with the same bell-shaped configuration with three spheres on the bottom. There are some very significant things about this UFO type. Under the bell-shaped hull are three spheres. 
It is these globes which, when excited by a high energy level, cause the UFO to become immune to gravity. At this point, the UFO begins to take on a glow. At a higher state of excitation, it is ready to move into its home dimension, a dimension which is not light years away, but right here, interpenetrating our reality. A significant amount of scientific research evidence now seems to confirm the amazing fact that UFOs such as this are interdimensional spacecraft. These same types of UFOs have been photographed, invisible to the human eye, by means of ultraviolet filters and have been found to be trailing our commercial airlines flights at 35,000 feet, just as this flight was tailed by a UFO right to its landing. This time, it was visible. We have presented evidence that many times commercial flights near a UFO have lost electrical control and their aircraft instrumentation. Pilots have confirmed this fact. Passengers have been injured as pilots have taken evasive action when surprised by a UFO which, to them, seemed to be on a collision course. Yet no world scientific agency or government group has seriously studied the problems of UFO encounters, or kidnappings, or losses of aircraft due to the UFO. Is the UFO mystery truly a scientific Watergate, an incredible and dangerous cover-up? Understanding of the UFO may be beyond our science and political system, but it is not beyond the human mind. The alien intelligences of the UFO and the human earthlings are all common inhabitants of the cosmic energy intelligence continuum. Dr. Lawrence at Ecola Institute showed us with his Stellatron that the alien intelligences of the UFO might be in cosmic communication by use of a high-level energy which we know as etheric, bioplasmic, orgone, or nearly a hundred similar names but it is unrecognized in our science and in our civilization which runs and communicates on the energies of the electromagnetic spectrum. Uri Geller mentally directs his biological energy and that of other people and they bend metal keys. In the vicinity of UFOs, aircraft lose electrical control and instrumentation and without doubt their structural integrity is also affected by this energy which bends keys. Other more incredible things are happening. During a single year, for instance, nearly 10,000 head of farmers' livestock have been mutilated in an area from Texas to eastern Oregon and Washington. Police and agricultural scientists alike are helpless. No flying predator exists which mutilates an animal's tender parts or swallows it up completely, leaving behind a bear skeleton. UFOs can be blamed, says the University of Wyoming student newspaper. There is now striking evidence that the cause is not a configurated UFO spacecraft, but what is mistaken for a UFO is something just as new to science. Invisible flying predators, which can be photographed with the aid of an ultraviolet filter 18A and ectocolor film. This was first accomplished by Trevor James Constable, a UFO researcher for a quarter of a century. Constable, in Southern California, builds equipment which gathers orgone energy, or etheric, or biological energy. Years ago, he noted that his energy gathering devices attracted invisible critters. He also photographed them at 35,000 feet through an ultraviolet filter near a commercial jet. They were invisible to the pilot. This is an artist's drawing by Don Dixon of one of the frames of the research camera's film showing the invisible flying critter. Apparently, the predator sought by farmers and county sheriffs nationwide is the animal killer. The invisible flying predator. There seems no other explanation of what has happened to the thousands of mutilated animals. 
Once again, a new scientific door is opened, and through it we see invisible animals which can fly by degravitating themselves and which seem to live off the biological energy of other land-bound animals. They may or may not have any connection with the spacecraft UFOs, but it seems they have been mistaken for configurated UFOs with their humanoid crewmen, bound on their separate mission of the study of the Earth's inhabitants by means of kidnappings and sample gathering of Earthman's devices. In the U.S., it is at Federal Aviation Administration flight centers that air traffic controllers are trained to handle the routing of aircraft in the nation's airlanes so as to keep constant eyes on the safety of flight procedures. But what about the UFO? What about near misses where UFOs and passenger airplanes were involved? These near misses have occurred, and when the pilot takes evasive action, passengers have been injured. This we know to be fact. UFOs are conveniently ignored by all. This is the FAA interpretation. Air traffic controllers are just that, not UFO traffic controllers. UFOs are ignored in the FAA procedures, even though it can now be proven that not only have near misses occurred, but that aircraft have been lost in the powerful energy fields of the UFO. The UFO problem has not as yet been permitted to be properly studied. Truly, is this expensive and complex world air traffic control system really adequate? The evidence now indicates that not only the military, but also the civil bureaus of world governments have been engaged in an incredible and deep cover-up of the real menace of the stepped-up UFO invasion of their target, Earth. The police departments of the world are helpless before the kidnappers of the UFO. This, too, we now know to be fact. How is this non-feasance possible? This is Joe Harrell. He runs the flight control center near Seattle, Washington. His job is to run it and train air traffic controllers. What we wish to point up now by a question is how extremely expensive governmental bureaucracy is able to ignore an obvious peril to world citizens by simply non-admission of the existence of this mind-boggling problem. To my knowledge, uh... UFOs are not included in any of the training programs. We would, of course, provide instructions to our supervisors on how to handle reports of UFOs, but it's not included in the training of a controller. So I suppose the only way in which it would be included would be in, and I, I assume you admonish these people to be uh, aware of any unusual circumstance. That's right. And, and, uh, and make the pilots aware of what they're aware of. And to this extent, it would, would be included, but uh, as far as specific procedures, no. After 60-odd billion dollars spent for manned space flight by NASA, it has been determined that man is truly confined to this Earth. The incredible secret concealed from the tax-paying public by both NASA and its congressional masters is that Man cannot participate in long space expeditions. NASA has scientifically verified and kept very quiet the fact that the unstoppable cosmic rays to which every astronaut has been exposed destroys brain cells at the rate of 1% every four months. Since the neurons of the adult human brain do not reproduce, a space expedition represents irreparable brain damage and would reduce the crew to idiots in even the eight years it would take to go to the nearest sun and return. NASA claims that the 13% loss of neurons would equal the brain damage sustained by an alcoholic, but NASA does not allow for increased intensity of cosmic ray bombardment as the astronaut moves in space. NASA must now admit that man cannot travel far in space because of significant brain damage which he will undergo. The main building of a graduate university of advanced study in Switzerland near Basel is Das Gotianum, acclaimed by architectural students and professional architects 
as being a space shape of striking originality. Das Gotienum was founded in the early 1900s by Dr. Rudolf Steiner, whose philosophy of science deals with the influence of alien cosmic intelligences on the human mind. Dr. Steiner was a highly trained scientist and clairvoyant who could see to a higher etheric energy dimension. He could see a view of cosmic reality which is denied to normal human vision. In some 6,000 lectures attended by the best minds of Europe, he made his observations known to those who would profit from this higher knowledge. This information is now available. Knowledge the key to the secrets of the universe, man's pursuit of the mystery surrounding the UFO and the Atherians continues. And although many books have been written about the subject, the best available information is speculation. So what we have offered you is the best available speculation. Two questions. First, who are the Atherians? Notwithstanding their similarity to man, the Etherian's body is different from man's. They live in their own dimension, so we see only their servants, the humanoids. The Etherian overlords of the UFO have thinking minds, feelings, and emotions like we do. They have a strong sense of will and a strong sense of purpose. And they live in their own dimension, so they can't set foot in our material world, according to Dr. Steiner. Next, why are they here? Why are they interested in Earth humans? Maybe we are doing something here on Earth that is disturbing their world, their dimension. Maybe we are doing something here on Earth that is upsetting the balance of the universe. UFOs have been seen for centuries. Is this recent stepped up activity over the last 30 years due to some recent disturbances within our dimension? Maybe we have sent giant shock waves throughout the universe, and the Atherians are here on Earth, trying to find out what they can do about this intrusion. One thing could well be the high harmonics of the sonic boom of the supersonic bomber, such as the B-1. An interdimensional space quake could have sent shock waves into their dimension. And of course, atomic devices could be another element that is disturbing beings in other dimensions. But the Atherians seem to be sampling our dimension by human kidnappings and the taking of animals and the taking of sophisticated electronic devices made by our Earthman scientists. The Ethereans seem to want to know what we are doing and we had better know too. Think about what we are doing to ourselves because it could have a profound effect on beings in other dimensions. And this whole question about UFOs could be a much larger question than devices simply flying around in our aerospace. We will meet the Atherians, the overlords of the UFO, when we are worthy. <laughs> <laughs>